All of the great and mighty works which God has done and is, and is presently doing is done with one goal, one chief end in mind, and that is to glorify His Son, Jesus Christ. We had seen last week, beloved, how in all of God's creation, uh, and oftentimes I believe that we can overlook things, or we come to the place that we look upon them somewhat with a, a sleepy eye, if you will, with regards to this, Every tree that buds forth on the trees this time of year, beloved, it is being brought forth in order to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Every tiny bird that hatches out of its way and pecks its way out of a shell, every last one of those tiny little birds, beloved, they're doing so for the glorification of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every drop of rain that falls from the skies, now in the springtime of the year, beloved, we see things greening up. Every drop of rain that falls from the sky, it falls for the glorification of the Lord Jesus Christ. These are the primary purposes in all of those things. In order for God to glorify the Son is for God to glorify Himself because Christ had said that I and the Father are one. From the very first day of creation and for a quintillion years into the future and beyond, this is and will continue to be the Father's plan, and His plan cannot fail, and His will will indeed come to pass in all of those things. There's going to be a few passages today, but make your way with me first of all to the book of Colossians, once again, chapter number 1. Colossians chapter number 1. And the Bible says there in Colossians 1 and verse number 15 with regards to Christ, the Bible says there, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Beloved, the Bible declares to us exactly who Christ is. Now listen to this there in verse number 15. Someone might take and say, well, who is Christ? What, who is Christ? Well, the Bible says of Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. As we had mentioned last Sunday morning, if you want to know what God the Father is like, then look to God the Son. Now, once again, the Bible declares to us with regards to who Christ is, the identity of Christ, the image of God, and with regards to those things, and this, beloved, because of who he is, makes him worthy of our praise. Amen. Think about this. Because that Christ is the invisible image of God the Father, it causes him and it makes him to be worthy of our praise. Now we know, beloved, most of you who are here, you've been Christians for a while. We know also that the Bible forbids us of worshiping any other God. Thou shalt have no false gods before me, no other gods before me. And if Christ is not God manifest in the flesh and we worship him, then we would be committing a sin in so doing if Christ is not God manifest in the flesh. But because he is God manifest in the flesh, we know, beloved, that we ought to be worshiping him, that it is the right thing for us to be doing so to be worshiping him. There's a beautiful song. It's more or less of a modern day song. But the song says, Lord, we worship you because of who you are and not just for all the mighty things that you have done. Let that soak in. Lord, we worship you, not just because of all the things that you've done. See, beloved, it would be easy, for instance, if, if I were a single man and I was praying, and I said, Lord, please send me a wife. And the Lord sends me a wife. And I said, boy, Lord, because you've been faithful to send me a wife, I'm going to worship you. And if I were to take and say, Lord, I need a new car. And please, Lord, send me a new car. And the Lord would send me a new car and say, boy, Lord, I'm really going to worship you double now. And I'm going to worship you because of the things that you've given to me. Beloved, there's not much more to that than having a genie in a bottle, to be honest with you. That you'll just rub the little bottle, get your wishes, and it'll cause you to worship that little genie in a bottle. But it is because of the identity, the personhood of the Lord Jesus Christ that gives to us our grounds to be able to worship him. And then, beloved, now don't get me wrong, then over and above all of those things, the Bible goes in from verse 15 to the identity of Christ, and then into verse 16, 
there where it says, for by him were, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Then, beloved, as we are able to view the Lord's creation, that is when we begin to worship him for the things that he has done, for the greatness of God, for the wisdom of God, for the way that God has perfectly sustained all of his creation from the very dawn of time up until this very day. The Bible says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Beloved, there's one God, and this one God is certainly worthy of our praise. In the Bible, once again, then it goes on to declare with regards to what the Lord has done in his creation, in the way that he has executed all of those things. Now, last week, beloved, we'd gone in, striven to go into the some of the details of creation, which declares the praise of the Creator, the glory of Christ in creation. But this morning, I would like to consider the glory of Christ in His creatures. The differentiation that we make there is between, obviously, the Lord's creatures being that which lives, that which moves, that which has its being, and then also the creation. Uh, once again, we realize that it's all part of the creation. We're all part of the Lord's creation. But with regards to the creatures of his creation, we refer more so to that which lives, those who live and move and have their being in Christ. Now, by way of just of a brief side note momentarily today, because of the greatness of Christ being established, not just here in the book of Colossians, but in multiple areas of, of the scriptures, because the ability to create is attributed to God, particularly to Christ, but to the entire Godhead. When the Bible says, let us make man in our own image, that us there is plural, being the fact that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were all involved with regards to the creation. But I want you to notice furthermore, beloved, as creation is ascribed here also to the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, once again, as we had mentioned last week, some people believe that Christ, that his work, that his ministry began when he was born there in the stable. Beloved, Christ is eternal. He is co-equal with the Father and he is absolutely eternal. His life, his ministry did not begin there in the city of Nazareth. Once again, we realize that's when he was manifest in the flesh. But Christ has been alive forever and ever and ever. He was simply manifested during that time. But I'd like for you to see this morning, once again, by way of a side note, do you see the devilish teaching and how the devilish teaching on the theory of evolution undermines the glory of Christ? Think about that. In other words, if the Bible says that Jesus Christ has created all things and by him all things were created by him and for him, and then someone else will take and say, no, 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 that's a lie. That's not true when the Bible says that. But instead the truth is that it all just came from a big bang. This is all just one big accident. Christ had absolutely nothing to do with it. Beloved, you're undermining the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ whether it is theistic evolution where people believe that God used thousands of years to create things through the process of evolution, or whether it is a full-on attack against Christ and people say that we came from monkeys and so on and so forth, that, beloved, is to diminish the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when it comes to the creation account given to us in the Scriptures, we believe, beloved, in the literal interpretation of scriptures. Now let me just mention a, a, little, a little explanation with regards to that. There is a method in which we figuratively interpret the scriptures. An example of us speaking figuratively is that if you're ever so hungry and say, man, I'm so hungry that I could eat a whole cow. And we know, beloved, if someone tells me that, no one looks around and says, well, let me check my phone. Surely I can find you a cow somewhere and we'll get you something to eat. None of us see that, beloved. None of us would believe that. But we would take and say, well, they, they don't really want an entire cow to eat. But what they're saying is that they're just simply extremely hungry. That's what they mean by that. Well, once again, beloved, in the scriptures, when the Bible tells the children of Israel that one shall chase a thousand, that is a figurative expression. In other words, that doesn't mean that if there's a thousand and one, that one of the children of Israel cannot chase them. It doesn't mean that if there's 1,500, that, that one child of Israel cannot chase them. That is using a figurative expression with regards to the language there. And yet, beloved, there are some who will take, and some of the scripture needs to be 
uh, needs to be interpreted in the literal fashion. Literal interpretation. Some of it, beloved, is with regards to a figurative interpretation. The golden rule of interpretation has always been this. When the plain sense of Scripture makes sense, then seek no other sense. In other words, when the Bible tells us that Daniel was in the lion's den, we realize, beloved, that makes sense. That was a means of execution or punishment back in the days of Daniel. We don't have to take and say, well, that lion's only figurative. It, it's not literal. Well, all of the other people had been fed to the lions in years gone by. That was a literal thing that took place. That was not figurative. But the point being, when it comes to the Lord's creation, when the Bible speaks to us about the days of creation and the evening and the morning were the first day, they were the second day, they were the third day, and it always uses that phrase, and the evening and the morning were. Beloved, that is one 24-hour day. In other words, we believe in six literal days of creation. We do not believe in the day-age theory where sometimes people take and say, well, that's not really six literal days. That's 6,000 years. And see, sometimes people will take and they will try to do that because they feel as though they're doing God a service. They will take and say, well, you know what? Christ put himself in a very embarrassing position. The God had put themselves in a very embarrassing position to take and say that they created all of these things in only six days. And they say, no one's going to believe that. So we will just help God out a little bit and we will take and change it to 6,000 years instead of only six days. And that makes it easier for people to believe. Beloved, God does not need any deliverance from his creatures. He doesn't need us to come along and help him out. He doesn't need us to come along and embarrass him and, and deliver him from the embarrassing position that he's put himself in. Beloved, the God that we serve, he's not embarrassed by his works. Amen. Not a bit. Now, once again, with regards to those things, 6,000 years ago, God created all of the creatures. Look with me in your Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter number 1. Genesis chapter number 1. And the Bible says there in Genesis chapter number 1, beginning in verse number 20, the Bible says there, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God excuse me, created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. In verse 22, and God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let, the, let fowl multiply in the heaven and the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Now notice in the sixth day on, in verse 24, and God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, the beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so, uh, still on the fifth day there. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind and cattle after their kind and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Verse 26, finally then, the sixth day. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. There's a phrase there wherein the Bible says, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air. With regards to the man, beloved, in God's original creation, man would have had perfect dominion over all of the creatures. <clears throat> Excuse me. In other words, I believe that in the original creation, that had man been hungry, that he could have simply walked outside and commanded a chicken to jump up in that skillet and lay down its life for it. I believe that he had had control over it. He would have had dominion over those circumstances. In other words, it would not have been storms that were beating men down, but man would have had dominion over the Lord's creation with regards to those things and in the book of Hebrews, the Bible goes on to tell us about that dominion. Thou has made him a little lower than the angels. But the point being, beloved, that when the fall had taken place, man lost that dominion that he had over the creation in that position. Now, you see, beloved, in all of the animal kingdom, 
God programmed into every animal exactly what they were supposed to do. Now think with me about this. The, the greater light to rule by day, the lesser light to rule by night, the sun and the moon. God told the sun and the moon exactly what they were supposed to do. And the sun, of, then the sun and the moon have done exactly what God designed them to do from the first day of creation up until this very moment. They have not faltered. They have not failed. The sun has not failed to shine one single time. The moon has not failed to be a reflector of the sun's light. And beloved, they have all done exactly what the Lord commanded them to do. And as the sun comes up in the morning, once again, it declares the glory of God. It declares that the Lord Jesus Christ is worthy of our praise. Not only that, beloved, with regards to the sun, the moon, and the stars, but when God created the animals, God had designed the birds that most of them, not all, but most of them would have the ability to be able to fly. That process, that ability did not come through a series of evolutionary years, but God gave those birds, most of them, the ability to fly, and not only to fly, but to sing. And in that regard, beloved, every bird on the face of the earth has always brought glory to the Lord from the days of creation up until this very moment. Not only did God create the birds with the ability to fly, but then also he created the dogs, the canine species, if you will, and he had given them the ability to bark and to growl and to wag their tail. And most of them, from the very first day of creation, when God created them, they are still barking, some of them growling more than others. They're still wagging their tail up until this very day. Now, I know some of you might say, well, Brother Spears, that's pretty simplistic. Beloved, I believe when we see a dog wagging its tail that we're able to take and say, you know what? That's a masterful piece in God's creation. God told that dog to do that 6,000 years ago, and to this very day, it's still doing it. God also created the cats, believe it or not. Amen? But God had created the cats. Sorry, sister. Amen. But at any rate, God had created the cats, and he had given the cats the ability to be able to meow and to purr. From the first day that God created those, those cats up until this very moment, what are cats still doing today? They are still meowing, and they are still purring. Not only that, beloved, but God created the cows to moo. You know what the cows are still doing? I've never heard a cow meow or bark one time. You know what cows are still doing? Cows are still mooing to this very day. What sound do the pigs make, class? You've done well, amen. That God created the pigs, the pigs will oink. They will oink and they will snort, and they've been doing that, beloved, ever since. God created the horses to say what? Hey, you all, you all done well, amen. God created the horses to do that. God created the sheep to bleat. And lo and behold, the horses, the sheep, the pigs, every last one of them have still been doing that which the Lord created them to do. And they bring glory to God by living out the active purpose which God had placed in them. All creation, beloved, declares the glory of the Lord. Then the very last day of creation... Oh, what a creature that the Lord had saved for last. The Bible tells us, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Beloved, could you imagine that? Formed man of the dust of the earth. Prior to Christ breathing the breath of life into our nostrils, beloved, we were nothing but a pile of dust. Nothing more, nothing less, but a pile of dust. And when God breathed that breath of life into our nostrils, beloved, we became a living soul. God in his infinite wisdom, he employs the use of a process in the creation of man. What I mean by this, beloved, is that there was a lifeless formation of dust, and man was created in the image of God, and man was God's growing or crowning jewel of creation. There was man created in the image of God. Because man was God's crowning jewel of creation, God had said, I'm going to give you dominion over everything. The fish of the sea, the fowl of the air. Brother Preston, could you imagine a fish commanding a fish to come up and jump on your hook? Amen. But the point being, beloved, is that man was God's crowning jewel of creation in the image of God. And not only that, beloved, that because man was created in the image of God, he imparted unto man volition. 
the ability to make choices. In other words, beloved, when we think about this, the fish didn't have that. None of the other animals had that. But man was given the ability to be able to make choices. Not only did God give to Adam the freedom to be able to choose, he also placed him in a position where one of the most weighty choices of all would be made. Now think with me about this. There is Adam there in the Garden of Eden. God had told him, Thou shalt not partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God had told him what he was allowed to eat thereof, what he was not allowed to eat thereof. And God had placed him there in the garden. God did did not handcuff him. God rather placed him there in the garden. He told him the right thing that he was to do, the wrong thing if he were to do it, and the consequences for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And Adam was faced with the decision, beloved, will I obey or will I disobey? Will I heed the word of God? Will I follow the instructions which God's given? Or will I choose to instead obey Satan and, and, follow, and follow what he is telling me to do? Beloved, we all know that in the process of time that Adam chose to rebel against God. Now think with me about this. Here is a man, the first man. He is created in the image of God and yet a follower of Lucifer. Could you imagine that? Created in the image of God and yet a follower of the devil himself. Beloved, there could be no greater chasm than such as that. Let me give you an example. If, you, if I were to introduce you to a man, and I would take and say, this man right here, he's the finest law officer, amen, the also for officer that's ever walked the face of the earth. I mean to tell you, he is the top cop. He is a, he is a keeper of the law. He's an enforcer of the law. And he's just the kindest man, the greatest man, best shot with a gun, everything else. And not only that, but let me also tell you something else about this man. Not only is he a fine officer of the law, but he's also one of the greatest Notorious bank robbers that's ever lived. What would you think in your mind? Brother Spears, either you're wrong about the description of this man, or one way or the other, something's breaking down. He cannot be the finest officer of the law who's ever lived, who's holding up all of the laws that he possibly can, and also be the most actively the most notorious bank robber that's ever lived. He cannot be both. Well, beloved, Adam was created in the image of God. God breathed into Adam the breath of life, and though God, though God breathed unto him the breath of life, when the devil came along, Satan chose to disobey the Lord and became a follower of the devil. Now, let me ask you folks a very pointed question then today. How are things looking now for the glory of God? How do they look now? For those of you who are parents, let me ask you the question. Have you ever maybe been in church or something sometime or another, and lo and behold, those of you who have children, maybe you hear a bunch of ruckus in one part of the building or another, and maybe you're sitting there in the pew and you think, man, oh man, I don't know whose kids those are, but boy, they're a bunch of noisy rascals. I don't know why in the world the parents don't do something with them. And lo and behold, all of a sudden you look around and you realize that it's not someone else's children, it's your own children. How do you feel now? What are you going to say about that? I can't wait to get those brats home. I know what you're saying, amen. But here's Adam, the first one created in the image of God. And Satan and all the rebellious angels are rejoicing. Did God have a lapse in judgment? What took place? Did something come up that God was not aware of? I appreciate the saying from long ago. You folks have heard it before. Did it ever occur to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? Did it ever occur to you 
that nothing has ever occurred to God. You know, the point is sometimes we might be in a meeting, we might be talking to someone, and we'll say, you know what, something just occurred to me. In other words, that popped into your mind on the spur of the moment. Nothing has ever occurred to God. Nothing has ever popped into God's mind on the spur of the moment. If that were the case, beloved, then God would not be the all-knowing God that he is. Nothing ever occurs to God. The fact that Adam chose to rebel against God and partake of the forbidden fruit, that didn't take God by surprise. God knew all along exactly, 100% with the greatest precision that we can ever imagine, God knew exactly what was going to be taking place. The very first man sinned, and because the very first man sinned, all of us, that rebellious nature has now been passed down upon all men. Now the question then is this, how is all your creation doing for you now, the all-wise creator? Remember when the Lord asked Satan, has thou considered my servant Job that there's none like him, an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? When the Lord had asked Satan that, Satan was not able to give a good answer with regards to Job. But here's the point, beloved. Could you imagine Satan up there, Satan being able to say, hey, look at your son Adam. Look at Adam over there, the, the one that's been created in your image. And look at him over there. He's over there chomping down on a piece of this fruit that you told him not to eat. Could you imagine that which was unfolding, beloved? But may I encourage you in this, and we, we, we realize this and we know this. Sometimes when we find ourselves in those positions, that we might take and say, well, did Adam know? Because, beloved, many of you have asked me about it, and most of you have thought about it if you're a Christian. There are times that we might say, well, did God not know that Adam was going to partake of that fruit? Why did God not just put that tree in the garden? Why did the Lord allow Lucifer to come into the garden? Did God know that Lucifer could come in? Why did the Lord allow all of those things? In other words, beloved, these things are valid questions that go through our minds from time to time. And what I oftentimes find, beloved, whether it is with regards to why was that tree there in the garden, or whether it is with regards to why is it that oftentimes good people will suffer, the Lord's people. Why is it that oftentimes good godly people will suffer upon the face of this earth? Beloved, the answer to both of those questions is this. Sometimes when we do not understand what it is that is unfolding before our very eyes, what is required of us is that we wait for just a little while longer. Just wait. What's unfolding here? Here we have Adam created in the image of God, and yet he's not answering to the Lord as though the Lord is the one in control. And said Adam is going after Satan and what Satan would have him to do. I don't understand. How can these things be? You just wait for God's glorious plan of redemption to unfold, and then it will all be clear. Maybe you're here and you're facing a severe, dire obstacle in your life. Maybe you're facing a problem in your life and you've also reached this point where you say, I just don't understand it. I don't know what God is doing. From my perspective now, it seems as though everything's out of God's control. It seems as though something has come along and it's taken God by surprise because why else would everything look the way that it looks now? Wait just a little bit. Wait just a little bit. Martha and Mary, your brother's laying there dead in the tomb. We all know that Christ loved him. We all know Christ has the ability to raise someone from the dead. We all know that Christ has the ability to heal those who are sick. But yet Martha and Mary are there crying their eyes out. What did they need, beloved? Wait for just a little bit and they will be rejoicing. There were three servants which were kidnapped, hauled away to a strange land. These three servants, they were servants of the Lord. Their names are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That was their secondary given names from the wicked king. As these three men were taking and they were serving the Lord, beloved, they ended up finding themselves in a fiery furnace. I would dare say that there from the midst of that fiery furnace, I, cannot, I do not want to ascribe things to them that may not be true, but I would dare say that if I were the one who were in the midst of that fiery furnace, if big 
old men were to come to take me by the arm and be dragging me to that fiery furnace, I dare say that Brent Spears would be saying, you know what? I don't understand this. I've obeyed the Lord. I've done what the Lord told me to do. And yet, boy, I feel the heat of that furnace and my face is starting to get red and I'm still 20 feet away from there. And here they are dragging me there to the furnace. When they finally get me inside of that furnace, I could not begin to imagine But I would dare say that Brent Spears, with his far too often frequent lapse of faith, would have probably been thinking, I thought I was obeying the Lord and I wind up in a furnace. I mean, this is God's plan. Seemed like it could have been improved upon a little bit. You know what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego need to do? Wait. Just a little while, and everything's going to work out. Daniel and the lions did the same thing. Daniel said, you know what? I'm going to pray. I don't care. I'm not ashamed of the Lord. I'm not ashamed of my prayer life. I'm not going to hide it. I'm not going to cease to pray. But I'm going to go ahead and pray. I don't care what the decrees of man says. I'm going to serve the Lord no matter what. And lo and behold, he ends up in the lion's den because of it. Once again, I don't know what was going through Daniel's mind during that time, but I dare say if it would have been me just as soon as my feet touched the ground and I could smell the smell of those lions, and lo and behold, I'd be thinking, you know what? I thought I was doing what the Lord wanted me to do, but I, I could certainly have found a better place than this to lure in. You know what Daniel needed? Wait just a little bit of time. The nation of Israel for 40 days, they had this big ugly giant that kept approaching them. That giant's name was Goliath. Goliath would come there and he would be blaspheming the God of Israel. And he would come out there on a daily basis. He'd say, you know what? If you are servants of the Most High God, why don't one of your men step up here and fight me for 40 days, beloved? The first day, maybe I'd have been saying, yeah, somebody else is going to step up and do it. The second day, I would have probably still been hopeful. About the 20th day, I would have been thinking, you know what? Maybe if the job's going to get done, I, I don't know who's going to do it. I don't hear any, 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 uh, anything that someone's thinking about it. But for 40 days, Goliath would come out there and blaspheme the God of Israel. For Brent Spears, likely on the 39th day, it would have been easy for me to think, you know, maybe I'm in the wrong army. Seemed like the army I'm in is not on the winning end of the stick here. You know what they needed to do? Wait just a little bit more. God had a plan for them. Deliverance through David. God had a plan for Daniel. God had a plan for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God had a plan for Lazarus. What was needed was just to wait. You see, beloved, because the first Adam had failed. In other words, beloved, in the mind of the Lord, when Adam had failed, when Adam disobeyed the Lord and chose to obey Satan instead, in the mind of God, everything was right on track. And you see, this was all part of God's glorious plan to be able to redeem unto himself a people. You see, the grace of God and the giving of his son, thousands of years later, shines the brightest in the blackest of night. Make your way back there with me in your Bibles to the book of Colossians, chapter number 1. Colossians, chapter number 1. And the Bible says there in Colossians, chapter number 1, in verse number 18... Well, we will go verse 17 first. The Bible says of Christ, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. In verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. When, Christ, when the Bible refers to Christ as being the firstborn from the dead, beloved, and then it goes on to say that in all things he might have the preeminence. In other words, he would be the first place. He would be the first one to receive glory. And as the Bible says, the firstborn from the dead, maybe you're thinking, well, there was that man back in the days of Elisha, that that man was lowered down on the tomb of Elisha in the Old Testament time, and that man that was dead, he came back to life. There was also the individual Lazarus, that he was dead and he was brought back to life. And yet the Bible says of Christ that Christ is the firstborn from the dead. What does that mean? How can that be? There were other people that were brought back from the dead prior to Christ being raised from the dead. But every one of those other people that were brought back to life, they faced death again. 
they still died. Lazarus was brought back to life, but you know what eventually happened to Lazarus? Lazarus died again. But you see, beloved, our Lord and Savior, he died once. And when he was raised from the dead, he will never die again. Amen. Never. Not now. Not in a gazillion years. Not ever. But we see there that Christ was the firstborn from the dead, that in all things that he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness will. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things on himself, by him I say whether they be things on earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. You see, beloved, because the first Adam failed, the second Adam was sent in order to succeed. And in the success of the second Adam, where the first Adam failed, the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, he succeeded. And not only does he, does he succeed, but he prospered, beloved. The first Adam rebelled, the second Adam obeyed. The first Adam, he died and he stayed dead. The second Adam, he died and yet he rose again. The Bible says, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Oh, beloved, what a glorious second Adam we have in the person of Christ. Death could not hold him. The grave could not contain him, beloved. But Christ arose victorious over those things. Now, as the Bible says there, for as in Adam all died. Let me ask you folks a question. How many died in Adam? Oh, that's what the Bible says. Well, as the Bible says, for as in Adam all die, the Bible goes on to say, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. How's that square with your theology? How's that work for you? Now, some of you, you're thinking about Brother Spears. It's about three and a half minutes till 12. You need to hurry up. We'll hurry up. It's going to be okay. But before we do that, let me ask you the question. The verse that is inspired and given to us in the scriptures, when the Bible says, for as in Adam, all die. We know, beloved, that all means all there. It doesn't mean that there was one tribe of people, one continent of people, one nation of people that did not die. But rather, when Adam died, beloved, all people, they all died. Every last single solitary one, they all died. But then the Bible goes on to say, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Once again, I ask you, how does that square with your theology? Does that present a little bit of a wrinkle in your theology? The reason that I mention that, beloved, is because there is a, a teaching with regards, it's a theological position, and it's called universal atonement. The teaching of universal atone, atonement, it teaches that every last individual, that they will all end up, uh, we will take it a further step, universal redemption. In other words, there are some people who believe that every last individual is going to go to heaven. Everyone, every last person who's ever been born, that they're all going to go to heaven. And the reason that they believe that is because the Bible says, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So if we all died in Adam, then in Christ we're all made alive. How can that be, beloved? Because the truth is that it seems like somewhat of a theological uh, hardship to be able to define. As I meditated on this and prayed about it, let me, let me try to break it down for you like this. In my mind, I think of a nation. We will say the nation of Russia. We will say that the nation of Russia at one time and still to this day, they're a communist government. In other words, I know that may not be politically correct, but they're a communist government. For everyone who lives in the nation of Russia today, they're all considered to be under the communist regime. In other words, that's where they have their dwelling at. Now, there may be someone in Russia who, who believes in socialism. There may be someone in Russia who believes in capitalism. But that does not change the fact that the nation of Russia is a communist country. It doesn't change no matter what that handful of people believe. They're still included to have their dwelling in the nation of Russia. Well, you see, beloved, if another leader would rise up 
And another leader would take and say, you know what? We believe in capitalism. We believe in parliamentary form of government. We believe in socialism. We want to get Russia out of communism and bring them in to a different form of government. Socialism, capitalism, whatever it may be, monarchy, whatever it may be. Lo and behold, beloved, for all of those people who desire that, if a new leader were to arise, they're now in a position to embrace a different form of government. The way that we're born, beloved, is that we're all born under, uh, in sin. We're all born with Adam as our federal head. But there is one named Christ who has come along, and because of his death, his burial, and his resurrection, for all who are in Christ, we now have life. Now, once again, is this life speaking of eternal life in heaven with regards to that one verse? As in Christ, all live? Not necessarily. But the point is, beloved, is that when we stop to think about that, Christ has come to deliver men from their sins. And all who are willing to look unto him, they may find deliverance from their sins. Now let me take you back then to the nation of Russia. There in the nation of Russia, maybe that old leader, he goes to a certain quadrant of the nation of Russia, and he says, you know what, I refuse to back up. I'm still going to be operating my portion of the country under the communist regime. Maybe it will then come to the place that people were able to take and say, well, you know what, I'm a communist from my head to my feet. I choose to live under that communist regime, and I'm going to stay here. Another group of people say, I'm not going to dwell here any longer. There's a new leader who is now on the scene. There's a new leader who has done so much in order to be able to liberate us. And because of what he has done, I will swear allegiance to that leader. When I think upon him, upon the cross of Calvary, I choose to look under the new leader. I choose to live under the reign of the second Adam. You see, beloved, through the resurrection of Christ, He has purchased unto himself a people who will be with him, praising his name throughout all eternity. It will never cease. Let me just read you this passage here. The Bible tells in the book of Revelation, chapter number 5, beginning in verse number 9. The Bible says there, Revelation 5 and verse 9, And they sing a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. That is a, a number basically what the Bible you could say no man can number saying with a loud voice worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Beloved, this will be the eternal refrain there in the glories of heaven because of what Christ Jesus has done for us back there in the book of Colossians, wherein the Bible says there, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If ye continue in the faith, grounded grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. In other words, beloved, we see there what Christ has done for us. And we see there that after he has called us, that we have that responsibility, as the scripture says, if ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled. You see, beloved, all who have truly been touched by the grace of God, they will indeed continue on. Those who have never yet experienced the grace of God, they may start for a little while, and then they will fall away. But those who truly are trusting in Christ in a saving fashion, they will indeed continue on. Finally, beloved, let me mention this. I preached on this subject many, many years ago when my dad had died. My earthly father, obviously. Even 
the inhabitants of hell. Because maybe you're thinking, Brother Spears, I thought all the birds bring glory to the Lord. I thought all the, every wave that crests on the ocean, beloved, that brings glory to Christ. I thought, beloved, that, that all of the trees, the, all the leaves, all the trees, every sunset, every sun, I thought all of that brings glory to Christ. And yet, is there not a remnant of his creation that's failing to bring glory to him? Those who have chosen to rebel against him, are they not failing to bring glory unto him and his name? Now think with me about this. Even the inhabitants of hell will bring glory to Christ. That's a hard morsel of theology, is it not? Maybe some of you will say, well, Brother Spears, that, that certainly seems harsh, but think with me about this. Let me ask you folks the question, what parents do you have the greatest respect for? If there's a parent and they have a child and their child keeps going over here and they're scattering hymn books and throwing Bibles and tearing things up, and the parent will say, one more time, 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 one more time. I don't know if you've ever been in the position where sometimes you'd just like to say to parents, I think that one more time expired about nine one more times ago. You know what I mean? Do you have greater respect for that parent or do you have greater respect for the parent who will take and say, if you touch that one more time, dad's going to slap your little hands. Which parent do you have the greatest respect for? Which is the better parent? Beloved, the truth is the better parent is the one that will stick true to their words. Amen. The one that will be faithful to their warnings. Now here's the point. The Lord Jesus Christ, he says there in the scriptures, John chapter number 14, the Bible says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And there's people over here, they'll take, see, you know what? We don't believe in Christ. We don't believe that he is the only way. We believe that we can make our own way. We believe that there's different roads and they all lead us to heaven. Your way may be through Buddha. Your way may be through Muhammad. Your way may be through Allah. But there are many ways into heaven. But Christ stands there and Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If there's ever another way into heaven and someone gets there apart from Christ, what does that say about the wisdom of Christ? Not much. Says there was something that slipped his mind. Said there was another way. And in fact, beloved, some people would go as far as take and say, well, Christ lied because he said that he's the only way and there are more than one way. So therefore, that makes Christ a liar. Therefore, he cannot be God. Such musings are dangerous to enter, down, enter in and start down that road. But you see, beloved, even the inhabitants of hell who take and say, you know what, we choose to rebel against Christ. We choose not to listen to you. We choose to go our own way. We don't love Christ. We love ourselves more than we love Christ. I love my opinion more than I love the opinion of the Scriptures or the commandments of the Scriptures. I hold myself in higher regard than I do God, and I don't care what God says. You know what, beloved? There will be a faithful day for all who have that mindset wherein the Bible says, that such people will hear the words, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. See, once again, beloved, with regards to the creatures, God's creatures, which were created and descendants of Adam, who are there in hell today, with every cry, with every murmur, with every groan, they're reaping the fruits of disobeying Christ. And the fact that Christ says that in hell that there would be uh, outer darkness, that there would be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Whenever you hear someone take, say, you know what? I don't care. Don't threaten me with hell because if I end up in hell, I'm going to have a big old party with all my friends. I'll be together with my friends. We'll be laughing and drinking and having a good time and the devil's going to be leading all the frivolities and the parties of hell. No, it will not. It'll be a place where there's no escape. It'll be a place where the worm dieth not. And it'll be a place where the sufferings will be for eternity. Because of the fact that Christ laid down his life and he commands all men everywhere to repent, to trust in him, 
if you neglect the eternal life given through Christ, then hell is the only place you can go. There's no purgatory. There's no other place for you. It's either in heaven or in hell. Now, beloved, let me ask you the question this day. The Bible says also that the, that the gospel, it is a savor of life unto life unto some and a savor of death unto death to others. What this means, beloved, is let me just ask you quite simply the question this day. Whether you're here and you're four years old or whether you're here and you're 90 years old, let me ask you this question today. How will Christ be glorified through your existence? How will he be glorified? Will he be glorified as you're there around the throne in the heaven saying, Worthy is the Lamb! Praise God! He's redeemed us out of every kindred and tribe and tongue. Is that how Christ will be glorified from your existence? Or will Christ be glorified from your existence by saying you disobeyed, you blew it? When Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden, beloved, God was glorified even in that because it, real, it affirmed that God is a God of his word. Beloved, the Bible says the soul that sinneth it shall die. Apart from the remedy of Christ, the soul that sinneth it shall die. How, beloved, will Christ be glorified from your existence? Through your obedience unto him or through you spending eternity and the eternal punishment. How will the Lord be glorified from your existence? Finally, let me just say this this day. If you take and say, Brother Spears, I want the Lord to be glorified from my existence by glorifying Him in my life. I want God to be glorified from my existence upon this earth and in my lifetime. I want Him to be glorified in the positive way, not the negative way. Let me ask you a question. How has God been glorified in your life in this past week? Huh? This past week. See, oftentimes people say, I want the Lord to be glorified in my life in that positive way. I want to be in the glories of heaven. Everybody wants to go to heaven. But the question is, beloved, is that if you're not presently glorifying God in your life this day, this past week, what makes you think you will glorify him next week? Two different kinds of people here this morning. Some who have lived their lives for themselves. They have walked according to their own rule. They have leaned under their own understanding every opportunity that they came to. There's another group of people who lean not to their own understanding. Only two groups. Which group are you in today? Which group do you long to be in? See, beloved, it's not just enough that, well, I hope I go to heaven. I, I hope something happens. Beloved, it's already happened there on the cross of Calvary. The blood of Christ has been shed. If you do not know him as your Savior this day, fall upon him. May your cry, may your prayer before him be, Lord God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Amen. Not, Lord, look at all the good things I've done but rather, Lord God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Let's all go.